everybody, Raul here for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the great honor and pleasure of chatting with none other than Ja Wobble. <laughs> How you doing, Raul? Outstanding, outstanding. Starting from the beginning, you have been laying down the low end for decades now, and there's a lot of interesting stuff, but we always like to go far, far back to the beginning. How did you get started in music and on bass? Well, punk opened the door for me. But as punk started, I wasn't interested in punk music in three chord kind of two chord, three chord rock and roll. I went to see Bob Marley and the Wailers. It was actually with the I3s at the Lyceum in 1975. And Aston Family Man Barrett was playing in the band. That just stuck with me. And then I saw some great bass players. I would always check the bass player out. I always listened to the bass on records. Even in my the, some of the earliest music I liked when I was like seven or eight, I listened to Blue Beat, you know, another name for ska music. Mm -hmm. And even then, you could hear the beginnings of the bass. And some of the reggae records, you know, started to get the bass started to get really pushed towards the late sixties, early seventies. And then you had like records like Aquarius Rock that came out about nineteen seventy seventy one. And I would listen to I just loved the bass. I never ever thought I'd be a bass player, but I tended to like the bottom end. You know, even on the piano, some of the piano parts. I mean, there was a track called Witch Doctor, and that, that had the thing on the left hand with the, with the piano. And so some of the lower notes, the lower register, resonated with me more. So then punk started. I was never going to be a guitarist because I, I, I got big Navi's hands, <laughs> and uh, I can't handle all those D7s and all that stuff. On the, that's not for me. And I could, so I'm a bass player, you know. And I, and I took to bass... When I first went on it, I took to it like a duck to water. There's only one other thing, or it's maybe two other things I've done. I started to play golf and it was very good to begin straight away. So I become very afraid and run off the golf course because mm -hmm. it was as if I was taking a drug that I knew I'd regret it. Yeah. And then clay pigeon shooting, you know, where you shoot the clay discs. And I was very good with that as well straight away. I was, it took me three attempts to pass my driving test. I think it's probably <laughs> harder in this country than the States. There are loads of things I took ages to get together, but bass I just took to. I just knew how to approach it. What I knew what I wanted to do, you know, which was make patterns actually. So mm. I was locked in a squat with a with a book to to read music. Bass clef. You want to play bass, and it had the bass parts to songs like American Patrol by Glenn Miller and Rock Around the Clock. And I started to learn it a bit, and then I thought, no, do you know what? I know what I want to do. I want to make patterns. I want to make B lines. And so I would just play B lines with changes. So stuff like pop tones, public image, very simple lines with simple changes. I've never really moved that far away from that approach, to be honest. Fascinating. So you're very much self taught? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's great now because I've got an inquisitive mind. And I've always I've, I've played with great musicians who were like teachers, like Jackie Liberzay, Holger Zuke, you know. So I was able to learn great stuff about music from them. But now on YouTube, you can go and learn certain chord progressions. And I love that because I can go on, learn a chord progression and utilize it or a variation of it in my music immediately. Mm -hmm. And you're always learning. So you can learn a lot of music theory stuff off of YouTube now in an instant. I mean, Circle of Fifths was something you'd have to learn at a music school at one time. But now you can learn Circle of Fifths or Fourths in two minutes. On, you know, we've got this wonder. It's a crazy world we live in, but we have access to information incredibly now, you know, in an incredible way. Absolutely. And it's also interesting that records and based on records caught your interest because one of the challenges that they've run into, especially recording bass, was that it put out so much power that if not properly recorded, it would bump the needle off the record itself because it, it had That's so much. That's what happened with Public Image, even. Yeah, yeah. Well, with Public Image, the, the group, I think probably three quarters of the signal was bass. And I loved and, and it was when I went to blues reggae dances. I was a white kid creeping into these reggae parties in Hackney, in East London, up the road from where I lived. And uh, the trousers would actually suck. It was a, a physical, visceral thing. The, those reflex speakers would suck your trousers. Your trousers would flap wow. when you went near it with the, with the power of the bass. So, you know, I love that, yeah. yeah. And very early on, I knew the problem of having a deck that had to be isolated away from all the vibration. Mm -hmm. 
So then coming more to current times, your band, Ja Wobble and the Invaders of the Heart. How did this band come together? Because you guys have been together for quite some time now as well. The original Invaders of the Heart was formed in around about 1981, 82. Mm -hmm. And then great band, great players. And then Mark, then that kind of wound down a bit towards the, the, the mid to late 80s. Maybe, maybe even a bit, actually, I think 88, 88. Invaders of the Heart, Mark II. And then Mark III was formed about six years ago, five years ago, six years ago. Maybe maybe more, actually, maybe maybe seven seven years ago or so, we reformed, I reformed the Invaders of the Heart, mm -hmm. you know, with new members, guys I knew. So there's been three basic groups, yeah. And in some instances, because I'd, I'd noticed as I was kind of reviewing some videos, more vocal-centric, you had Sinead O'Connor for a while that you guys were performing. Yeah, oh, but there's been a ton of guests. I've had a ton of guests in the band. Nice. And I've done a lot of stuff outside of that, out of the, out of the group context as well. So I've done solo gigs. So I've done, I had a band called Deep Space. I had a band called the English Roots Band, which did folk music, you know. So it's a fairly loose thing. I think what the Invaders of the Heart was a fusion thing. Mm -hmm. And actually it came to be a fusion thing, but also a, a thing where, whereby I play my past canon or my canon, the job of canon or my what minor hits I ever had. People come to it. I think people come to an Invasion of the Heart show expecting to, to hear a mix of sounds, some, hear some great musicians and hear some stuff they're familiar with as well. So that's what it's come to mean over the years. And it is such a blend of kind of musical genres. I'm glad you use the term fusion because as music evolves, I capture the reggae elements, a little bit of the punk elements, ska, the dub. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's got a, a loose definition there, but it's ongoing. And, and certainly as I yeah. listen to some of the music over the years, you can see kind of some of the subtle changes and things. And then you sing as well. Yeah, I sing a bit. I'm not a great singer, but I'm like a guy that plays a, a tough cop or something. I'm, I'm not saying I'm like a tough cop, but I'm like a typecast mm -hmm. actor, you know. So when there's a certain kind of vocal, pseudo-spiritual lyric, I'm the pseudo-spiritual lyric guy. You know, that's my typecast, you know. So for a certain kind of thing, I'm kind of good. They're very limited, and that's fine. I, I can probably sing barely in one octave, I'm afraid, you know. <laughs> but but when it's right, it's right. When it's right, it's right. You know, yeah, yeah. Hey, you know, look at the bad, greatest movie actors. Their face is very large on the screen. They make small movements. They say sometimes a few lines, but it's how they do it. That's what makes them the great movie star. Mm -hmm. yeah. Gear-wise, how are you getting your sound? Well, I don't use any effects generally. Everything's in the fingers. That's <laughs> where the phrasing really comes from. And you'll feel with the fingers rubbing against the, the strings. You turn, I tend to sort of turn a lot of the upper mid-range off, you mm -hmm. know, so I'm careful with the mid-range and the upper stuff and lower mid-range for that. I'm careful with mid-range generally. I have a lot of emphasis around 80 hertz, so it's kind of, you feel that in the stomach, that's where it resonates. And gear-wise, I like bare-faced cabs because they're very light, you know, so no, no bass player likes lifting heavy stuff. I don't like my techs lifting, so my techs love Basically, so we have bare face, they're very light, mm -hmm. yet very rigid and have a good sound. Ashdown or an amp I'll use, Ampeg. What's this, Agu Aguila? Aguila. 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 Yes. Um, uh, they got one of them at Ronnie Scott's. I think they're probably very hard to get endorsements with, but if they're watching this, they should give me one because <laughs> I'm a very nice person. But um, that stuff's fantastic. So I'm looking at them. We've got a gig lined up next month, believe it or not, at Ronnie Scott's, the jazz club in London. And they've got one of those rigs there. I love that stuff. Mm -hmm. I use a Fender Precision. I did use an, a Magnum Ovation for years. I've got a couple of them. Now I'm using a Fender P again, and I've gone back to basics. I use round wound strings. I was using flat wound nylon 88s. Now I'm using standard gauge round wound, rotor sound, standard scale was extra, uh, long scale, whereas with the Magnum and the Ampeg bass guitar, I had to use extra long scale. Now, an area that many times gets overlooked has to do with how you're getting the signal from your instrument to your amplification. Do you have a preference in cables? 
Oh, God, no one's ever asked me that before. <laughs> it's a kind of base text. I've said to me, you can't use this cable. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So you have the shielded, proper shielded cable. Um, I like the cables that uh, I've got a few in there in my little studio. Yeah, the, the silver and black. I don't know what they are, the silver and black colored cables, but mm-hmm. I like the look of them. So I use them. God knows what they are. But they, <laughs> to me, they Jack to Jack. No one calls them Jack to Jack anymore. I still call them Jack to Jacks, you know. Absolutely. I think many musicians, as we get started, what it is is whatever I can afford to get. That's kind of the beginning. That's probably where your texts are going, you can't use that anymore. That's a terrible cable. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. Yeah, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll tell me off and then they'll, they'll get me a better cable. But you make do, it's not to do the equipment, it's to do with your imagination, it's to do with your feel. Sure. You know? So the first bass I had was a cheap Music Man copy with a ridiculously high action that I probably made worse. <laughs> I sold the, the cable, the wire, and the amp for, for, to get alcohol and drugs. And so I was left with this Music Man in a squat. And an apartment we was and everyone left. I set fire to the furniture to keep warm. Oh. Everyone had enough of me. Everybody left. And he, I, I didn't even have a bed. I had a headboard. And I'd lean the base against the headboard with this awkward action and play. Bad. It was so awkward that when I then got hold of a Fender P with an amp, hey, you know. It's like martial arts. Sometimes you used to train with big, thick brass rings. Yeah. It's hard. And you take them off, suddenly it's a lot easier, you know. Yeah. Looking ahead a little bit, I know that you and your band had tour plans for this year, as yeah. did many, and yeah. they were impacted by the pandemic. So everything has kind of gone on hold. What's in the future? We're hoping that tour will be restarted for autumn, the fall, as you'd say, of next year. We have got a show next month at Ronnie Scott's, a socially distant show. Nice. I mean, socially distant shows are nothing new to me. I've done socially distant shows many times years ago. You know, um, it's just a joke, um, yeah. if you know what I mean. You know, you've got not many people there, you know. But um, <laughs> <laughs> you got it, you got it in the end. Yes, um, yes. But, you know, we're doing Ronnie Scott's, and then actually we had an inquiry today. I think we've got a couple more coming up in the new year. But then in the fall of next year, we'll be back out again. I've seen a whole list of shows coming in. But hey, Ralph, who knows? Will everything be up and running by the year? Who knows? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So one can only hope. I mean, you, you would certainly hope that in a year's time, everything could be cool. Yeah. You know, the, these viruses sometimes are around. I've, I've got a great deal of respect. I'm not a COVID uh, conspirator kind of bloke, a COVID conspiracy guy like some of my friends are. And I, you know, it exists and it's horrible. You don't want, especially with an older guy, older woman, you don't want to be catching it, you know, oh, if you can avoid it. Agreed. And yeah. back with the music, you had released, actually earlier this year, Ocean Blue Waves. Yeah. Any new records in the works? I know people are always kind of... Uh, Ocean Blue Wave come out, Realm of Spells had come out. I've got an album with my family recorded. My wife's a musician, both my boys are musicians, so we've got a family album called Guan Yin. That's, there's a couple of the tracks already out digitally just to keep it moving. That's going to come out on vinyl in the new year. And before Christmas, I've got a couple of CDRs and digital albums coming out. One called Nocturne in the City, which is a load of really cool jazz things that I've made, like keyboard progressions with some nice bass. And that's a double album. And the dub album, all that I did in the lockdown. So there's a dub album as well. So that's a dub album, a single album, then a family album. And there'll be another group album next year. So I'm always making records. It's no big thing. Gotcha. Well, it's a perfect time if you can't be out in the general public to... It's so easy to record now. Um, On this, on the thing we're doing this on, I can do everything. It's It's incredible. Yeah. I plug my bass in. It's incredible. Great. We appreciate you taking time, folks. You've seen him here. Ja Wobble coming to you live on Bass Musician Magazine. Mm-hmm.